Okay, welcome back. Um, the last uh, uh, class, we looked at uh, a couple of um, important points. We've started on understanding a biblical perspective of marriage. We looked at how God is the designer of marriage. We've been looking at certain aspects of uh, principles or perspectives that the Bible talks about marriage. Um, we looked at a couple of points. We spoke about how marriage is a good thing. A marriage is an institution that needs to be honored. Uh, marriage is a covenant, a solemn covenant, and marriage is between one man and one woman only. Okay, uh, we have, uh, I think, another two more points before we end. Um, let's look at uh, uh, the next perspective that uh, the Bible talks about, which is that a marriage is uh, a union of two, marriage being a union of two. So for that, uh, we've already read Genesis chapter 2, verse 24. Now, I would like someone to read Ephesians chapter 5, verses 31 and 32. So would someone kindly unmute and um, read that? Ephesians 5, 31 to 32. Ephesians 5. Ephesians 6, uh, okay, Ephesians 5, 30 to 31. For we are members of his body, of his flesh, and of his bones. For this cause shall a man leave his father and mother, and shall be joined unto his wife, and they too shall be one flesh. Verse 32 to Anthony. Okay, 32. This is a great mystery, but I speak concerning Christ and the church. Thank you. So when uh, there are, there is this phrase that, that has been brought about both in Genesis chapter 2 verse 24, which we looked at earlier, and Ephesians 5 31. It talks about being one flesh. Okay, so when we look at one flesh, what are we looking at? It is being one in spirit and to be united. So think of it this way. If you take two papers, you know, take two papers, when you glue them all together um, and you attempt to separate it, you would notice that they do not come out clean, right? You glue them together, keep it for a while. And then when you attempt to separate, they do not come uh, clean, to get a clean uh, separated. There will be something stuck off the other on another, right? So that's what one flesh means. There is so much of unity. It's almost like there is one united person. Being one flesh is being one united person in all aspects of life. So it is two people who become united, so much so that they appear as one. And the example that Paul talks about in Ephesians here is the union of Christ with his church. And that's a comparison that he's given. It's, it's, um, it's a parallel that he's showing. It's in the same way that the union between a man and the wife occurs. So Christ and the church are to be that united. So much so when you look at in scripture that Christ is in us and we in him, we, uh, when you look again at scripture at 1 John 2, 6, that we walk as he walked or we live in this world um, uh, uh, that our lives here in this world are uh, the same as Christ, that we imitate Christ in whatever we do. So it says imitate Christ, right? So it, it, it is to, to this point that Jesus said that, um, you know, that, that those who receive Jesus also receives us. So there is that perfect oneness in the, in between Christ and his church in the spirit. And this is the same mystery. It's the same truth that is spoken about even in marriage, the way that a man and a woman 
come together, they're one in spirit, and they're united in one person. Okay, so in marriage, um, I, even as they make that um, uh, covenant, they are made one in the in God's presence, and then it continues on, you know, to establishing itself over and over out in everyday life. So they live out of that oneness. So this this place of becoming oneness is something that evolves day to day. That is an ongoing process of really uh, growing together, discovering one another, so that every day they come to being in a place of oneness. So let's just look at what are some of the words that really describe this becoming one. one. And what does it actually mm, encompass? So what does it uh, what would this oneness oneness mean? So this becoming one flesh, and often I think it's just in sometimes it's just interpret, interpreted as a physical oneness. Now that's just not it. There is a lot more in that oneness that we're looking at. So the first um, key word that describes this becoming one is what we look at is the relationship. Now when you build a relationship with one another, your, your, your goal or your outcome is to become one, to be in oneness, to be in agreement, right? And this relationship is established or you establish this relationship by trust, by love, by affection, by understanding, by knowing one another, by really uh, uh, knowing how they think or what they would want, what they would like, um, what really helps them to uh, feel loved. Now, this comes only in the midst of a relationship. It just doesn't come, um, you know, out of the blue. A relationship needs to be built. It needs to be encouraged. It needs to be um, built on little by little. And that comes when two people come together, spend time together, discuss, talk, share, work through certain activities, are open to understand what the other one likes. So that's what building a relationship is. So this takes effort. This takes time. This takes intention as you build on a relationship. So you could probably think of, um, you know, in general, maybe in your lifetime, especially maybe for those who are not yet married, in the way that you have related, how did you build strong relationships with people? And you may, you may say some of the characteristics of that is, you know, when you take time to spend with one another, or even as you're spending time, you may have certain questions that you ask to really understand the thoughts and the perspectives of one another. Or when someone is emotionally down, you are there to support and encourage them. That in turn enhances the relationship. Or when there are conflicts with one another, you go back to sort that conflict because you value the relationship. So this establishing of become one must be built on a strong relationship. And this relationship, like we said, is intentional, is something that you do consistently, is something that you put in effort and you establish it with love and with respect and with understanding. So that's what we look, one of the words that describes oneness is a relationship. The second word that described it is what we call as a companionship. Companionship is something that we call as a friendship, where uh, a friendship or a companionship is developed when you are actively in the process of building the relationship. So it's a process of building the relationship. And that happens maybe when, when you're communicating, when you're sharing of life's concerns with each other, when you care for one another, when you spend time with one another. That is the process of building the relationship, of saying, that, okay, this is my companion, this is the person that can walk with me or goes with me through life. So that's another word that we use to describe this becoming one, companionship. Okay. The next one is agreement. When we look at agreement, what is it 
that we sing. Agreement is coming to a place where we are willing to consider that our opinions or our ideas or would be very different from the opinions and ideas or viewpoints um, of the other person. So uh, it is to come to a place to consider these ideas and come to a common place of understanding, which will help and uh, benefit the marriage or the family at large, rather than benefit an individual's needs or individual's ideas. Okay, So it is the ability to understand or to know that my opinions and the other's opinions may be different, but of how they come or arrive to a place of coming to some agreement or some um, goal or some uh, outcome that will largely benefit the purpose of the marriage or the family. So that's what agreement. So becoming one is being willing to agree to with one another. OK, um, now, now, even as we're talking about agreement, the very fact uh, so sometimes uh, I think that the questions that come about is what if um, or or uh, it, it maybe in, in marriage we shouldn't disagree on anything. Uh, that I think we will also be talking about when we look at resolving conflicts. The fact that we disagree on ideas or thoughts is because we are made differently. God has made each one of us different. Our experiences, our lives, our um our situations, our understanding, the way that we've been brought up have all been different. So we come with certain perspectives or certain ideas. So having disagreements is not a problem. It's all right to have a disagreement or to have another opinion, have a differing opinion from somebody else. The point is, how do we arrive at a place of resolution, arrive at a place of coming together is what is a skill or is, is what something that in marriage we come together to. So disagreements or differing viewpoints or opinions is, is something that you can expect because that's what uh, that's that's how we all are. We, we, we are very different. But how we arrive at it, how we resolve something is what matters. So when we look at a larger purpose, the larger purpose of how God wants to benefit a marriage or family, or how God sees a responsible role in decision making. All of that matters when we are looking at agreement. Okay, so keywords here: uh, two, two, three words we spoke about is relationship. We spoke about companionship. We spoke about agreement. Okay, let's uh, look at the next word. The next word we look at is to is complementing one another. So complementing one another. Remember, this complementing is not uh, spelt with an I, but it's spelt with an E. That is the complement is someone where you support one another so that what you're doing benefits the other. Or, uh, or maybe some of your own weaknesses, some of your own strengths uh, complement the other person, or some of your weakness complements the other. So even though we may be different people, we are individuals who are different, we can be put together or fitted together so that we can support and complement one another. Maybe I think we, let's, let's look at an example. So um, uh, in, let's say in, in a couple, you may have one person who is, uh, who is more um, uh, very practical, in the way that they make decisions, whereas the other person is more emotional in the way that they make decisions. Now, these are just two different styles of making different uh, decisions. But it is good when you have different styles, you work together to complement uh, a decision making process. Someone has a practical consideration, whereas the other person may have an emotional consideration. So when Either when both parties or when both individuals come together, understanding 
that the background from where they're coming from is different, but it, it generally is for, the, for a similar outcome. It becomes a lot less cumbersome. It becomes a lot less difficult. So to, uh, to acknowledge that maybe your spouse is more practical oriented and to acknowledge that you may be more emotionally oriented is a good thing, but coming together to complement so that one may be able to see, you know, may not really look at emotions and just may make a decision on something. Whereas the other partner may look at emotions, say, okay, maybe we should go slow. Maybe we should do it in a slower process because of the kind of emotional impact it can make on the entire family, whatever the, uh, the issue may be. So complementing is another word that describes um, becoming one, okay? We look at another word, it is unity. Unity it's how, is how uh, we work together to collaborate with one another, to cooperate with one another, even when there is a difference, um, the difference actually become a reason for building something together, okay? So there is a lot more strength in the fact that there are differences and these differences are used as a benefit in order to make a decision more unified. So that's what we mean, intimacy. Intimacy is, in, in other words, it's also call, called as closeness. Closeness where um, you come to, where there is a freedom to, uh, to be open, to be um, vulnerable, to, to, to bear out, to give out without holding back. That's what closeness, uh, what intimacy means, okay? And, and closeness is, is the relation with one another. So the ability to be open, to not hold back, to not withdraw, but to, to be in a place of vulnerability, to be in a place of complete giving in, to share, okay, in every form, whether it be physical, uh, it be emotional, intellectual, spiritual, financial, uh, to be able to give without holding back, okay? So these are some of the words that we, we use to describe this oneness, okay? Now, I just want to take a couple of minutes uh, to bring about questions. And um, the, the class is really quiet, and uh, I, I don't like the sound of it. So please bring about any questions. If you don't want to unmute, please put your question down on, on the chat. Yes, yes, Nina, go ahead. Sorry, that was by accident. <laughs> oh, okay. All right. <laughs> Okay. Uh, all right. Yes, Tira, go ahead. Ma'am, yeah, my question is like not question, but when we read Genesis, there we see like it's not good to be meant to be alone, no, ma'am. And then again, when we see like Proverbs, it's it says like uh, he who finds the wives finds the good things. It's talking about men. What uh, there is any reflections where it's talking about women? So we can apply this for both, uh, Chira. We can apply this for, for both, whether it's a man or a woman, we can apply this. Okay, okay. Actually, some okay. people, yeah, ma'am, but uh, my, I asked because one of my friend, like he asked me before, like it's it's uh -huh. written about only men. There is no mention of women. So women case, a woman can like uh, stay single till like, uh, you know, end of the life like that. Okay, so um, about singlehood, we are going to be talking about that in chapter three, where we're looking at reasons for singlehood. Okay, and uh, but 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 these verses that talks about you know man finds a wife is a good thing. It is something that can be applied to both a man and a woman. Singleness is is not just meant for woman or man. That's not what it is. Singleness it needs to come out of out of godly reasons and purposes and that's something we will look at chapter three so we speak about that uh in uh when we come to chapter three okay all right uh prince has asked is there any particular age to get married okay now when we when we look at marriage if you look through the ages through the culture um you have you have child marriages where 
children get married at age 9, 10, 12, 13, OK? Uh, and then you have um, um, marriages of, of uh, as soon as uh, uh, the man and the woman reach uh, reach adulthood that is 21 or 18 or that which is given by the law then they do get married or there are people who get married um, much later in, in age so there isn't a, a specific biblical answer to that I mean there is no commandment about uh, about the uh, about what age uh, you you get married however we use our practical reasoning to understand that um, so think of it this way, uh, for a man or a woman to mature, when we're talking about maturity, we're looking at all aspects of maturity. There's physical maturity, there's emotional maturity, there's sexual maturity, financial maturity. Um, maturity comes uh, not, not only by age, but also by experience. But definitely, there is physical maturity that happens by age, which means um, physical maturity is generally complete between the years of 18 to 21, right? Um, and, and so we're just looking at a physical aspect. But there are a lot. Uh, it's just not when someone is physically ready to get married, they can they can marry. They definitely need emotional maturity. They need financial maturity. They need spiritual maturity. Now that is a process of growth. So when we're looking at at that, that's one way to understand it. That uh, um, you know, even as as they as a person grows into maturity. And they are in a position and a time and a place of preparedness. That's another big um, uh, prerequisite. Are they prepared to enter into this institution of marriage is another way that we understand that people are mature enough to be married. So not just maturity physically, but also growing in emotional uh, maturity also having a preparedness of marriage. Now, marriage is not something that you can we, we just get in and figure out on the way. It's always good to be prepared, which means you establish yourself, you build yourself, you learn skills that, that are needed in marriage, you learn how to deal with one another's emotions, you learn um, how to work with, uh, 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 work with, with in, a, in a team with your, with your husband, learn spiritually what God desires of you. So when we're looking at an age, it may be difficult to say a certain age, but then it needs to come from a place of preparedness and a place of maturity, right? And, uh, and definitely, I'd say if you're looking at an age, definitely not something before 18 uh, or um, 18 to 21, not, not before that, because you're still building yourself up in major, uh, maturity. So to grow, in understanding of what marriage requires, both physically, emotionally, sexually, uh, financially, spiritually, it requires things. So to be able to prepare oneself before they can get married. OK, I hope I answered that question. Someone asked, how long should you date a girl before you get married? OK, now um, there isn't any if you look at the Bible, there isn't any concept of dating. Dating has come as a concept, uh, and I think it came in as a concept in the 19th century, is what I, if I if I remember right. Before that, there was no concept of dating, and I think in the Indian culture, for those of us who are in the Indian culture, it's a it's a fairly um, you know uh, recent. A practice maybe in the last uh, two decades or three decades or so, right? Um, now, like, like I said, it's not a principle in the Bible. However, when you look at it, it it's a different concept in different cultures. In some cultures, um, uh, they are encouraged to date before they get married. In some cultures, you know, there isn't um, anything of, of dating. I'm sure some of us who are married here probably didn't even, you know, met your husband or your wife 
uh, one time, maybe spoke to them the second time and probably got married the third time. I don't know. Do, do we have anyone here like that? You could just put a hands up or uh, anyone like that here? Or you all did have time to get to know the person? OK, there isn't anyone here. But uh, if, if you look at general, there, Shiva Kumar said, said so, right? So it's not, uh, uh, it, it's not something that, that um, you know, there isn't a, a, a specific statement to it. But then um, I think as if we look at it as a biblical practice, so one of, one of the things is important is you do not date for fun. Dating is not for a pastime. Dating is not for peer pressure. Dating is not because everyone else is doing it. Um, if you're seriously looking at dating, it should be with the outcome of marriage. OK, and uh, uh, so if, if you when we look at the concept of dating, I personally recommend don't build relationships because you want to date. You know, build the relationships, make friends, have companions, work together in groups, understand how people work and how people engage with one another. And then out from that, if there is out of your observation of people, if there is someone that you may be interested in, then approach to ask if they would be willing to get to know one another, right? And uh, so, so it, the, even even working towards marriage can be done in a in a very mature form, <clears throat> rather than you know getting quickly into a relationship because you found someone attractive and then trying to figure out if this works towards marriage. But being observant, building um, larger relationships, and out of that, trying to examine to see if there is someone who, who you find compatible, and then trying to work together to see, having conversations to see if this is something that leads to marriage. So dating, in my opinion and understanding, shouldn't be done for fun, shouldn't be done it's, as it's a pastime, or shouldn't be done because everyone among the youth are doing it, or it shouldn't be done because you know you don't have anything else and you you want uh, you know a boyfriend or a girlfriend. I think all those reasons are um, are very very superficial reasons, and those reasons can get us into trouble. Dating should be with the purpose of marriage. Okay. And uh, there again, there are, uh, I think it's also a personal preference. There may be some who do not want to date and uh, want to get straight into marriage. And I think that's perfectly uh, OK as well. Um, in my understanding, dating also, um, it, it's cultural. So uh, you know, sometimes in maybe your own family or your, your own uh, larger family, like your parents, um, they may not have the concept of dating. So it's always important to have that open conversation with the family members, with your parents. Have that open conversations about what they think about dating, what guidelines do they see, because they're your family. They know your culture. They know where, where you're from. So discuss that with them. Uh, and it's always better to do things within their knowledge than to do things outside of their knowledge. So these are some of the guidelines. and. Uh, I don't think I have a yes or no to your answer. Uh, I don't know who asked that question. Sean, um, there may not be a yes or no to the answer. I think it is dependent on a lot of these factors. I hope I answered, Sean. If not, you could give me a follow-up question. Uh, yeah, so in conclusion, you should first be friends, yes. And, and I mean by friends is you know, one among probably many friends that you have. And then if you have marriage in mind, bring about a discussion, open it up with, with your family if, uh, uh, you know, to, to, to bring it in. Otherwise, it just causes a lot of issues and conflicts and negativity. And then, you know, discuss marriage uh, uh, going forward. Yeah, Sean, I hope that works, helps. OK. Prince, you have a question. Go ahead. Uh, man, no. like, is uh, 
people getting married after divorce is it biblical or like is it right uh, to marry a uh, divorced yes. daughter divorce okay divorce okay divorce divorce okay like, exactly. uh, so, in match in mark chapter 10 uh, jesus tells like if a man divorces his wife and marries another woman uh, he was committing an adultery mm. but at the same time in old testament if we see god himself tells to hosea to marry uh prostitute woman who is a prostitute and even after she is unfaithful to him god still uh, tells him to bring her back to his home mm. Mm. and also there are many such as uh, many in many such as they encourage like you know if they are getting their divorce they will tell uh, they were encouraging to get another marriage so mm. is it right or is okay. it wrong okay so friends we are going to be talking about this in the latter chapters in i think it's overcoming challenges and we are going to be taking this issue of divorce okay and uh, we will talk about that in context of that so uh, can i can i defer your question to when we are going to be doing that chapter so it will come in a lot more of context otherwise uh, you know i may not give you an entire picture so i want to be careful that uh, we bring it in the context and what uh, you know what about divorce how how god sees divorce and what happens after so is that possible that we can discuss this question when we look into that chapter yes ma'am okay thank you thank you any other questions if not we'll move on okay all right so um going back to this place of becoming one like we said um this uh, this uh, the the marriage being a union of two to become one the ability to do that becoming one is something that can happen only through god and only because of god because that's something that was designed by god this becoming one was designed by god this is something only god can help us do okay because like we said we're all different we're all we have our own individual ideas and thoughts and to do that it really needs the power and the help of god it is now the process when we are becoming one i also want to share that it does not mean that you lose who you are it does not mean that you lose your own identity or the your likes your dislikes the kind of ideas or thoughts or opinions you have it doesn't mean that you need to lose it so that you become like the other person but it is uh it's almost like a parallel it's it's something that perfectly fits together it's mutual fitting of two people so in what does that mean it's that the differences that both of you come with that the husband and wife comes with it does not bring about a division but rather it draws the strength from both people so that there is a perfect balance in the way that you do things okay so even though there is a, even though there are differences this differences is not that separates or divides people but it takes the strength out of these differences and brings about strength so that there is a balance like i like i explained um that earlier uh, uh you know that example suppose a person uh, so maybe let's talk about um let's talk about maybe a, a husband and wife trying to decide about uh, uh let's say a school for their child okay so the so one of the parents may or the one of the husband or wife may feel you know it's okay to shift them mid year from one school into another for example okay shift them one into another it doesn't matter because it makes more practical sense to do that maybe uh, you know it's one term is over they can start off with the second term in the next uh, 
uh, next uh, within within one month they can start off with the second so that's a very practical way of looking at maybe the other person the other partner or the other spouse says no you know it may be emotionally too damaging for the for the child so let's give it some time we will prepare the child in it we will take them to that new school show the school around help them to see what they can engage in so you know these two it's it's the strength that you can use the strength from both the people you use to come to a place of agreement so maybe they decide that you know we will give it maybe two three months time and then allow the child to go through a preparation but because it um, makes more sense to get them into a new semester we should probably do them in two months whatever right so it is to uh, draw from the strength of two people so that you know they can come together and uh, align and work for something for the good of the child two people coming together so that's what it doesn't mean that you lose your own self you lose what god has put inside of you or the identity that you have but take the strength out and work it together mutually um, coming complementing one another so the strength comes out okay so when we looked at what marriage was we we saw that marriage was actually brought about or designed so that the things that would be um, uh, th that if a man would be alone you know it would eliminate this feeling that man is alone or be isolated so when we experience oneness in marriage it eliminates that uh, that isolation it eliminates that selfishness it eliminates that loneliness and it brings about togetherness okay so we need to see that when we're talking about oneness if any of the partners um, stand and feel that you know i need to have my way done always that is going to destroy this oneness and companionship in marriage okay that is going to break that marriage okay now even as we're talking about marriage in this context we want to bring about another understanding of oneness and that we take from 2 corinthians chapter 6 verses 14 to 18 so can somebody read that 2 corinthians 6 uh, chapter 6 verses 14 to 18 would someone read that please Prince, I will answer your question, okay? After after I finish, I'll answer your question. Can someone read 2 Corinthians 6, 14 to 18? Do not be yoked together with unbelievers, for what do righteousness and wickedness have in common? Or what fellowship can light have with darkness? What harmony is there between Christ and Belial? What does a believer have in common with an unbeliever? What agreement is there between the temple of God and idols? For we are the temple of the living God. As God has said, I will live with them and walk among them, and I will be their God, and they will be my people. Okay. Um, so when, when uh, okay, you could read 17 and 18 too. Uh, okay. Jackins? Yeah. Therefore, come out from them and be separate, says the Lord. Touch no unclean thing, and I will receive you. I will be a father to you, and you will be my sons and daughters, says the Lord Almighty. Okay, thank you. So another um, uh, context of uh, oneness that we want to emphasize is what Paul has brought about here, is to not be unequally yoked with another unbeliever in marriage right and uh, he brings about many um, you know he's reiterating this uh, this fact of how uh, being yoked with an unbeliever can uh, you know the absurdity of it he says you know what accord has christ with belial what part has a believer with an unbeliever what agreement has the temple of god with idols so that's another area of oneness the spiritual oneness that comes from being one in christ being uh, believers in christ being seeing christ as the god and savior uh, of their lives all right so that's another context of 
oneness. Now, although this entire um, scripture, these passages are not specifically speaking about marriage, we can take the truth of it from uh, and bring it, present it in the context of marriage. When, even when you look at Amos chapter 3, verse 3, it says, you know, if two people don't walk hand in hand, they are not in the same place. Are they going to the same place? Or, you know, a house divided by itself will fall. So th these are some things that that um, um, that uh, uh, that that we also look about in in marriage. Okay, so uh, why do we say that is because why does Paul really refer to that? Because the differences that there are in the way and a believer and an unbeliever lives or the what they believe in, and that can become uh, issues in conflict or issues that affect the marriage. You know, especially when it comes to things with regard to the faith. Um, they can become uh, issues in, in marriage, okay? Um, I think there are some questions. Uh, sorry. Not able to see those questions. I think, uh, yeah, there's a question here of uh, what does it mean to be yoked? Okay, Prince, I'll get your question. Sorry. So, what 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 does the yoke what does yoke mean? Now, yoke is the meaning of yoke uh, uh, is Sean. Okay, uh, if if you've seen you know farmers tilling a land, you may see you know there are two bulls that are there, and then they put uh, uh, they put something across them, and two of them are the ones that carry it together. Okay, and that's what you call a yoke. Okay, you you couple two animals together and attach with this thing called a yoke. That means they go hand in hand together. That is coming together. That's what we 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 un, uh, is the meaning of yoke. Some somebody that you attach something, a device that you attach between the animals, and it is to. Uh, they make it together to work the land, okay? So that you're holding those two animals together by this thing called the yoke so that they walk together in oneness. They walk together uh, um, so that they can, they can till the land. That's, the, that's what the word yoke means. Okay, I'm just going back. I think there are a couple of questions here. Just go back. Um, uh, Prince asks, can we consider age when getting married? Is it okay to get married to a person who's five to six younger years younger or older than the age of the person? Now it's important. Again, there is there's no biblical reference to it, but as I said, it's about maturity, understanding the maturity of the person that you're getting married to. Uh, when you look at science, science does say that women do mature uh, faster and earlier than um than than men okay so girls do mature faster and earlier than boys and that's why as a result of that is when there is a, an age gap that is there but uh, like i said it's it's important to understand the maturity level now that's a generalization that's a general principle that doesn't mean that you know, you hold a uh, 21 and 21 year old man and a 21 year old woman together that, uh, you know, uh, the, the woman may, may be uh, more mature. It may not be that way, but that's a general principle. And that's why uh, there is a recommendation that men should probably be older. But even if you're marrying someone your age or someone younger, the idea and the understanding is complementarity. Are you able to complement each other in marriage? Is there maturity in different areas, spiritual maturity, emotional maturity, physical maturity? Um, uh, is, is there understanding of what marriage is? Is there a preparation? Age is something that can be, you know, it's not something that should be, it shouldn't be a major consideration if you are able to see this part of maturity. Okay, I hope that answered that question. I think, Nina, you asked, uh, today there are different views about homosexuality, even among Christians, that some people are made that way or inclined in a particular way. What do we, uh, what do we say to them? 
Is it perversion alone that starts it off that causes this inclination? Okay, so um, uh, there are now. Now, when we look at um, studies like this, if you look at these studies, there isn't an conclusive study that says that people are born or made that way. Okay, there isn't a conclusive study. If you look at all the studies, it's it's uh, 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 it's 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 uh, speculation that that has been given. Now. Uh, in my, the way that I understand it is the minute that we get into an argument of that people are made that way, um, you know, we, we are we're probably not going with a certain backing. We're not going with a real scientific backing because if we haven't read enough, we are actually, um, you know, we, we, we don't know enough. But I think what what do we... How do we engage people in a uh, conversation when it comes? Is the minute that uh, we state or we challenge people? Um, now, now this again, uh, as I'm saying this, I want to share with you that what Scripture says is absolutely what we are backed with. That it is not God's design. However, when you are in conversation with someone. Um, the minute that you're going to bring it about with the person saying, hey, what you're doing is wrong, it's sin, it's a perversion, um, it's it's something that you shouldn't be, that's where you've lost the person. Okay? Because in, in today's day and time, you will hear a lot of uh, uh, understanding of, you know, uh, you have, you are offend, you have, you have offended me, or, you know, you are intolerant, right? And this is when, when we bring about the judgment on people's condition or issue, we've immediately lost them. But the way that I see it is to help them to challenge their beliefs, challenging them in the way that they were created. So one of the biggest way that I attempt to challenge people is when God created or when we were created, if they don't believe in God, when we were created, we were created as man and woman. And even if you look at the differences, the physical differences between a man and woman, it is in a way to complement one another. But whereas a man and a man or a woman and a woman do not complement one another, even in their physical reproductive structure, they are not complementing one another. And that becomes a challenging thought to people. A lot of times um, people are groomed to believe that they should go ahead and do things in, if they feel it the way that they that uh, uh, that they are. So when you look back, you know, especially when uh, young young teens, when they grow, when they are just developing their sexual identity, they have confusion about their identity, right? And it is it's common among teens to have a confusion about their identity because of a lot of. Uh, earlier past uh, issues or upbringing or media focus that's come, they have a confusion about their identity. But if we tend to, um, uh, uh, you know, if we if we tend to build on that, if we tend to uh, encourage that they should choose the identity that they think they have in mind. Uh, you know, we are encouraging something, but rather to challenge them and give them the support that, you know, this is the way that God's made you. So the confusion that you may be having is real, right? The confusion you may be having is real and helping them to sort out that confusion in time. So that comes from a challenge in helping them see different aspects of their identity, of their sexual identity, rather than uh, you know, nipping a conversation in the bud by saying that, you know, they may be in sin or they may be in a place of perversion, but helping them to challenge and understand where they are at and why they've come to a place. Now, these conversations are long. These conversations may be long winded. It doesn't happen within a day. It's something that you continue to engage them. And that's what really demonstrates your love for the person, that you have not condemned them as people, but you, but you don't condone their lifestyle. And because you don't condone their lifestyle is why you challenge them to think differently within the physical aspect, the emotional aspect, the spiritual aspect. So 
how we deal with with them is 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 a challenge i do see that it's not something it, it may not be easy as a two two three statement answer but it's something that really requires deeper thought deeper discussion because the person you're talking to is a person is a person with a specific issue or with a specific challenge and so the way that we approach it is to be sensitive and is to be loving in the way that we challenge them rather than bringing it down as a, you know as as a sense of you know what you're doing is absolutely wrong but helping them challenge them to see that where you're coming from is with a place of love and and what you are bringing to them is an issue that they need to consider in their mind so you know engaging with that takes time engaging with them takes that patience takes that love stepping back from the need to Uh, to bring about a quick judgment but but by slowly helping them challenge and then showing them how it is so away it's so um absurd from the design that god has for them okay so it's something that takes a lot of time okay i hope i've brought about a bit of an answer nina on that but um you know uh, yeah maybe at at a later discussion we could probably discuss that a lot more okay there's one more question speaking about not being yoked with unbelievers is it applied only to the spouse or to the whole family it's applied to the spouse because you you you're becoming one with your spouse not with the entire family so if you all are in agreement to one another um you know you are becoming one yes the entire family can become a challenge and that's why it's important to discuss about these matters during marriage and some of it we will discuss about in our next chapter in preparation for marriage okay um, i think i've answered all questions yeah okay all right uh, we'll go on to the last point and the last point is marriage being a journey of love till death do us part so uh, scripture again says what god has joined together let man not separate so the principle of marriage is that marriage is for a lifetime and we continue to build and grow ourselves in our marriage till death do us part till co- god calls us um, till then we continue to experience and uh, work through our marriages so just a quick recap about the biblical perspectives of marriage marriage is a good thing it's an institution to be honored it's a solemn covenant it's between one man and one woman it's a union of two and lastly it's till death to us part all right thank you so much for the wonderful discussion let's just close with a word of prayer and um yeah then we can wind up let's just close with a word of prayer heavenly father we just thank you for the richness of your word god we we uh, see how much lord your heart is towards marriage and how you wanted your children to live out this institution you've designed father we pray god that you will empower us equip us to live according to your plan and desire for marriage lord even as we come across people who don't follow this design give us a heart of love give us a heart of wisdom give us a heart of discernment to challenge people to think of marriage and relationship in the way that you have designed it to be holy spirit help us god even as we may encounter people like this help us lord to build our own lives i pray lord for all those who we are on this call those who of of us who are married i pray that you will protect guard and enrich our marriages according to your word those who are yet to be married i pray that you will prepare their hearts in a way to follow the design that you have for them thank you for being with us in jesus name we pray amen Amen. Thank you all. We'll meet next Thursday the same time um on on the on following this. God bless. Thank you to the e-learning students as well. God bless you all. Thank you.